house of the Lord. You love going to church this morning? Come expecting? We're going through Hebrews 8. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer before we get into our study. Lord, we're so grateful to be able to gather together this morning, Lord, and we just ask, Lord, that you'll fill our fill our bowls full today, Lord. And we just, Lord, as we meditate upon your scriptures, Lord, we come, Lord, with needy hearts, and we just ask, Lord, that you'll give us what we have need of. Grant it, Lord, that as we unpack these words, the, the, the words of Paul, Lord, as we're studying these things out, Lord, that you'll help us to understand in your name. Amen. <clears throat> So Paul was saying uh, after, he, and you know, Hebrews chapter seven, he was laying out who Melchizedek was and and uh, and talking about those things. And so he begins in Hebrews chapter eight, as, as we kind of looked at a little bit last last Sunday. He says, "Now of the things which we have spoke, spoken, this is the sum: we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the Majesty in the heavens." a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. And in Hebrews 9, just to kind of compare with that scripture, he said, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And you think about after Christ died on the cross that he was able to go to go past the veil of his flesh into heaven to present the the, the atonement that he had made to, to say it uh, everything that uh, everything that was typed on earth in the Old Testament now has been accomplished. When the high priest in the Old Testament would go once a year to sprinkle the blood on the on the uh, the mercy seat, all of those things were signifying that something was going to come, the true atonement that would be once for all that our 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 spiritual high priest. Melchizedek, God come down in flesh, would come once for all to pay the price, and so he entered in, entered, entered into heaven itself to prove that the price was paid. So if we if we kind of examine that, and I, I, and I apologize, I'm trying to get better about my small font, but uh, so I know this was a lot crammed in. But just just listen on this slide, and then we'll, some of the other slides, uh, Lord willing, will be a better a better size font. <laughs> Uh, so his his blood. You think about what his blood did for us. His blood that that he entered into heaven itself to prove that the price was paid for us. His blood was the entrance fee to heaven. His blood paid the price for us to go to heaven. His blood was the cleansing agent. It clean cleaned us out. So that so that uh, the uh, it, you think we were um, on the way to church this morning. Uh, sometimes my wife will read a scripture and and she was just reading through the book of Acts about all the things that Paul had done and you think about a man like that that had actually gone into people's houses and drug them out and grabbed them by their coat and drug them to be and 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 said I want these people to be killed but yet the blood of Jesus Christ was sufficient to clean all of that and you, you so the blood his blood was the cleaning agent to clean all of our past up uh, are passed off. His blood sealed and ratified the new covenant. What's the new covenant? The, that the life of Christ would pay for our sins so that his life could come and dwell in the, new, in the believer's heart. His blood took care of the sin issue once for all. And that's in Hebrews 10 and, and uh, all these different verses in Hebrews 10. His blood brought, bought us eternal redemption. It was the exchange that took our sin and bestowed on us his righteousness his blood made peace with God. And that's really what the, if the, the point Paul's trying to make, that he's the mediator of this new covenant. The me, what is a mediator? Somebody that's, that's, that's to, to, to bridge the gap and to also say that all these things that have been promised are going to be fulfilled. Right. So Christ came to say, to, to say that all these things that are written about in the Old Testament are going to be fulfilled in, in, in Christ and in the life of the believer. His blood made peace with God. His blood undid everything that sin and death ever took, ruined, or stained. His blood gives us confidence to approach God boldly by faith. If you have, if you, if you recognize by faith what God did for you, then you, it gives you confidence to come to Him boldly for whatever your petition is, whatever His Word says that you have access to. His His blood paid the price for that. <clears throat> so Paul goes on to say, then verse three, he said, "For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer." For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. 
as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So what, what gift did this man give? He gave his blood. He gave his life. He gives his life in you and the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the gift that this man gives. But a, 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 an earthly priest would, would have gifts of things to, to offer, but this man had his blood to offer. In verse 6, he said, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then, that, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with him, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And we've kind of been examining with that new covenant that, that God's life, that he would give his life for us, that his life could, be, could, be, could live in the believer. The rest of, the, the rest of, uh, of, of chapter 8, he's actually quoting Jeremiah. And we kind of read that last, last Sunday. He said, for finding fault with him, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, well, I, will, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. You know, that's kind of something I kind of wanted to sit on for a little bit in this, in this lesson, because we think... You know, Christ Christ paid the price for us, and He made a way for us. But the way the the way that He made is for us to be changed. There's going to be a, an effect in our lives if you if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He He died to put all of those Old Testament laws to put the effect the essence of those laws into the heart of the believer, so that they could be lived out. So He said, Jeremiah. He's quoting Jeremiah. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. <clears throat> so what Christ did when he died on the cross was he fulfilled the law. You know, what fulfill, fulfill means is, is, if we could just think about that, there's a lot of things that were prophesied and spoken of in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in a lot of different ways. There's, there's, there's things in the Old Testament that um, we're, we're looking forward to the day that we're living in, like Ezekiel 36, that I'll give you, I'll soften up your heart and, and give you a new spirit and, and, and then give you my spirit. Those, that's looking to our day. There's things that, that were speaking of Jesus, that, that a virgin shall conceive and how he was going to come and where he would be born in Bethlehem and those kind of things, that the atonement will be made. So Christ he fulfilled, he fulfilled that, that there was an atonement going to be made. But yet there's, there's part of that. There's, there's le things left for you and I to fulfill as well. <clears throat> That's why we were, we were speaking on, as you see the revelation of Jesus Christ unfold, you can't help but see the revelation. You're part of that revelation unfold as well. Because if you're part of him, you've got, you've got something to do as well. That's what, you know, really what the New Test the Old and New Testament is. The Old Testament, taking that, that law, the law written on stones, and the New Testament, put it in the believer's heart. Amen. So the, what, what it looks like is if you really under, get the true understanding of the Old Testament, the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and the New Testament is fulfilled in his bride. Amen. So now you've got a picture of the Old Testament as, as the groom, Amen. and the New Testament is the bride. And you've got that now you've got a picture, a love story coming together. So, so what uh, you know, what we were kind of getting in last last time about how the, the the law, the really to really fulfill the law, it's it's fulfilled in love. Well, you got a love story that's being unfolded here. Right. You got a love story where Christ died on the cross so that his bride, so that he could be married to his bride, so that he could call his bride to himself. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, two, two, two wings, two wings that are, are kind of spread out, but, but really it's a picture of a, of a bride and a, a, a bride and his, and his groom. So you think about what the law, the law has got to be fulfilled. Everything's got to be fulfilled. And so now let's take a, a little quick detour. Let's go on a rabbit trail like we did last Sunday and talk about Jesus fulfilled the law. But now the bride's going to fulfill the law too. How she's going to, how she's going to fulfill the law by becoming what the essence of what God wanted us to to be how to love your neighbor and to forgive others and to 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 be able to love people the way that God wanted to love somebody that, that hates you. 
So uh, and, and on, when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He, he's not coming to just uh, scrap it, to do away with it, but to actually manifest what the law was speaking of. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So the whole body of text has to be fulfilled in somebody. Somebody's going to live it. Now, right. Jesus Christ was the living. When he, when he opened up the scroll and read there in Isaiah and, and identified himself with the scripture, he was the living manifestation of what he was reading there. Right. So when you read in the Bible and you're, you're, you also are the living manifestation of the words that you're reading on the page, come off the page into a living reality. Yeah. So it's all got to be fulfilled and you're fulfilling it as well. To fulfill means, if you look in Strong's Concordance, it says to cause God's will as made known in the law to be obeyed as it should be. I see in the Old Testament, they couldn't, they couldn't live out the law. They, I mean, they tried to, but, but we, the difference is when you got God inside of you, God actually living it out, it, then the essence of what the law means it can, can be fulfilled in the way it should be. That's, that's to, what it means to fulfill. In the Oxford languages, it says to bring to completion a reality, to achieve or realize something desired, promised, or predicted. You see, I, that, there's this idea that uh, called antinomialism that, that Martin Luther, that's a big word, but Martin Luther and John Wesley and all of them fought against this idea that when Christ don't, died on the cross, that we don't have to live out like the Ten Commandments. That there's this idea that people uh, down through the ages have have have, have kind of they, they they've they've thought that well, when I since I'm a Christian, I don't have to live according to the law anymore. I don't have to. I can just throw away "Thou shalt not kill," "Thou shalt not steal." I, I have a right maybe to do something, things in secret, but the blood of Jesus Christ just covers it over. But you see, you don't have to do anything to come to Christ. But when you do come to Christ, that law will take effect in your members and it will begin to change your thinking and change your doing and change, change the way that you work so that you, you won't steal and you won't, you won't uh, do those things. Right. <clears throat> There's going to be an effect uh, of, of coming to Christ. Uh, that's why Romans says, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's what the Holy Ghost was sent for, to fulfill the law in you. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Oh, you mean we got to be subject to the law of God? Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now you think about being subject to the law of God, but if you go back and read what, what the law, the, the, this is the, the, just a sample of the 16, 613 uh, laws that are, that are in the Mitzvah, that the, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but to know there is a God, to have no other gods, to know that God is one, to love God, <clears throat> to fear God. And these are all the th all the things that are in the law. If they just they just scroll up, not not to profane His name. That, see, you, when you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, and this becomes real, that you can really do these things. To listen, well, it stopped scrolling on me. <laughs> to listen to the true prophet. Well, we'll just keep going. But see, I was just trying to highlight an example that, that, that God, he wrote all these things down and in the New Testament, the essence of those things in the Old Testament are being fulfilled in us. He said, in, in, Paul said in, 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 in verse 13, he said, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So Paul said in 2 Corinthians, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, 
not of the letter, not like the letter of the things that we read, all these things that we have to adhere to, like washing pots and things, but of the Spirit, the essence of the things that are in the Old Testament. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? All of those things that were typed in the Old Testament are now being fulfilled in us by the Holy Ghost. So Christ's sacrifice met every requirement of the law, but the life of Christ and the believer will be a living manifestation of the essence of the law. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And the second is like this, Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. In Romans chapter 13, he said, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now you think that if true love is manifest in the life of a believer, then the whole law is, 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 can be summed up in the fulfillment of that. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. That's a weighty statement in it, that love fulfills the whole law. In Galatians chapter 5, he said, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And in James chapter 2, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. You see, we're living in an age, though, where love has been redefined into something that doesn't match what the Scripture is. We think, we use, we use when you start talking about love, we use it as an occasion to say, well, I'm not being treated right. But if we'll take what the Bible says and examine ourselves and try to match up with that, then we can really, we'll really see what the essence of what love is. Love is, love is to not put yourself above somebody else. To always be looking for the other person's benefit, to try to reach out, to try to be, to try to be, uh, to be inclined to see the other person come to salvation. Because that's that's where our goal is to to give others eternal life. You know, and and this age that we're living in has twisted love around to where you know either even children they, they don't when love is being shown to your children you know sometimes they'll say well you don't love me. But love is the definition of what love is has been twisted around so that when you try to show love, it's, well, you don't really love me. But love, love, love is, love is like a, where the Bible talked about the prophets would rise up early in the morning and, and, and try to tell people the truth and rebuke, rebuke with long suffering. Because love, love wants the best for you. Right, right. Love, I, 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 maybe, maybe just meditate on these things as we, as we go through these scriptures and think about what love is. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But when he, when he died on the cross for, for all the, the Israelites and back then they, they didn't recognize his love that he was showing to them. Whoso had this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. <clears throat> And in 1 John chapter 5, he said, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. And by this we know that the love of children of God, that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So there's, there's how you know if you love God, if you love his word. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments. Because if you love God, then, then you're, you, if, if the love of Christ is in you, then you will have a desire to fulfill the law, to fulfill the essence of God's word, to walk in his word. <clears throat> so what some examples of love in the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul said, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Everybody, when you want to seek, seek the, the, the benefit of others instead of your own. Hebrews chapter 13 says, 
Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So, so their love is being expressed in hospitality. Why? Because you're trying to get people to Christ. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. That's why we have the prayer request every morning, because we're remembering those that are, that, that are in, in, you know, have infirmities and, and uh, in, in bonds of their mind and suffering because the devil's got them in prison, in a prison house. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. Love, love is just being content and not comparing yourselves with others. And I, I, you know, I like to quote that, that saying that comparison is the thief of joy because when you start, when you're not content and you start comparing yourself with other than others, and that's the devil to take your joy away. But just, just, just be happy with what you got. Philippians chapter two says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, because we want to help one another, help one another to, to, to grow up the stature of a perfect man. So Romans, Romans 13 said that love is the fulfilling of the law. Brother Ram said in the brass serpent, he said, God has a law and that law is love. Then if I love God correctly, that I'm going to testify the truth about God if I'm in love with him. I've got a wife's here in this building. Now, see, what, what is it, what's this got to do with Hebrews? Because I was, as I talked about in the beginning, the Old Testament is the groom and the New Testament is the wife, so it's really a love story. So if you love God in the right way, God, God doesn't have, like, he's, he's trying to make this, paint this picture of you don't have to, his, his, his wife didn't have to tell him, you better not. You know, sleep around with some women when you're overseas. You better not do all this kind of stuff. When, when it's a picture of love, then that, everything works in harmony. When you really love one another, then you don't have to worry. Brother Brown said, I've got a wife here in this building. God knows how I love her. Well, you know, everything good and everything good and everything is going to be for my wife. You know that sure, just like your husband would be to you. Now, well, now, if we love God, then my confidence it becomes perfect in him as I love him. So if you love God and you know that he loves you because you, because you can see in his word all these promises that are laying there waiting to be fulfilled, then you can have confidence to come boldly to his throne, knowing that we've got a high priest and all these promises that Paul laid out for us because we're in love with him. And that gives us confidence that he's going to be there for you. Whatever, whatever life throws at you, whatever the devil throws at you, because it's love. Love is what gives confidence. Now he can't break that law of love. See, because it's in my heart. So now that means that even when you fall and make mistakes, you got a love relationship. You, you're in love with God and you know, he loves you. You have confidence that he'll forgive you of your sins. So Paul goes on in verse, in verse 1 of, of chapter 9, he said, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the heart of the covenant, ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over at the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. He's talking about all these things were a shadow of the reality that we have access to now that is being fulfilled in our lives. All of these things, the golden censer and the pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded were symbols of Christ living in us to fulfill his word. Because in verse 8, he said, the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the, all of those things represented the Holy Ghost, that the way into the holy, uh, holiest was not yet made manifest whilst, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come, 
by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. It's his blood that paid the price. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the, pl- of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who, purged, who, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? To serve the living God. He, wanted, he wants to change us. From, you know what dead works? Dead works is looking at those Old Testament rules, Old Testament laws is like rules and regulations you have to follow without your heart being changed. Something that you look at and say, well, if I can just act this out and, and just be a good pharisaical actor, then you met the requirements. And we're, we'll, we'll, we'll close on this. In Mark chapter 7, he, said, he answered and said unto them, well hath, I, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, and as, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me. They were worshiping according to what they thought the law required by, you know, doing things just with an outwardly appearance and washing pots. And you know, he said, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things like you do. And he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. And in Matthew chapter 23, as the musicians come forward, he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. God wants to change our conscience, our thinking, from dead works to a living reality filled by the Holy Ghost, quickened so that the law is actually made manifest in our members. And how is it made manifest? Through love. Because love is the fulfilling of the law. And when you love God through the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you love one another, you're actually fulfilling all the old things that were prophesied in the New Testament. And you become a living, walking testament of those things that they could only probe at. We'll stop there. God bless you.